Searching for Cindy, written by Gregory Patrick Travers. Can I ask you a question? Sure, I said. She sat up from the bed, resting her elbow on the pillow as she arched over me. Why do you keep calling me? That's easy, I said. You're hot as fuck. She shoved me playfully. I'm serious. What does it matter why I call you? You get paid, don't you? Yeah, but, I mean, do you realize the age difference between you and the rest of my clients? They're old. Way old. And here you are, a handsome man in the prime of your life. I, I don't get it. Why do you call me? I sat up to meet her. Are you insinuating that I can't get a girl to fuck me for free? I didn't say that. Because it's never free, you know. There's dates, all that gas money driving them around, listening to boring stories I have no interest in, all of this in hope that I might get laid. With you, you come to me, I pay you, we fuck, you go home. No games, it's a sure thing. It gives me the things I need and it keeps out the things I don't. I don't know what you're so upset about. If you're fucking a bunch of old dudes, I would think that coming here would be a nice break for you. She smiled as she pulled her hair up into a ponytail. Fuck, I love that. Listen to you. I should be so lucky to get your call. Besides, I continued, this isn't a conversation I should be having with my call girl. This is something my mom gets at me about. When are you going to meet a sweet girl? When are you going to get married and have kids? She checked her watch and, surprised how much time had gone by, hopped out of the bed and headed for her jeans curled on the floor. We never went over our time since that one incident where we fell asleep. We woke up to her driver banging on the door and yelling at the top of his lungs. She was extremely embarrassed and I was extremely scared for my life. She talked him down though, explaining what happened. He let me go without harm but promised, if it ever happened again, my last breath would be short to follow. I was just trying to give you some friendly advice, that's all. Don't you want to do better in life? Get a good paying job? A family? I didn't realize we were such good friends, I said. And who are you to give me career advice? You're a hooker. Her head sprang up, a lot less friendly-like. Hey, fuck you, asshole, she said, putting that skinny Asian finger in my face. I make over a grand a day. I make money. I drive a nice car and have a fantastic apartment. You make shit money and you live in this fucking dump. So that's what makes a man? His car and his apartment? Oh, and what do you think makes a man? Uh, his penis? She groaned in frustration, slid on her top and paced quickly out of the room. Your money's on the table, I called out to her. I heard... Yeah, I know! Thanks! And she slammed the door behind her. For the next couple days, Cindy's words resonated with me. She really knew me, that girl. I realized how sad that sounds, but hey, my life had been nothing short of tragic. The reason I called her in the first place all those months ago was to help me get past my addiction to cocaine. I figured, since I was spending all that money just to end up feeling horny and alone, if I took that money and spent it on a hot Asian prostitute instead, it would be an all-around better choice. And it was. Whether I was paying for the sex or not, I was still having it, and at that, having it with a stunningly beautiful Korean girl, who I was sure wouldn't have fucked me under any other circumstance. The sex gave me something to look forward to. It gave me more confidence to get out of bed in the morning and face the world. But most of all, it got me off the powder. It sounds weird as I sit here telling you that fucking a prostitute made me a better person. But it did. And boy, did Cindy treat me good. Thinking about that made me feel bad I was so rude to her the last time we were together. All she did was try to give me some sound advice. I even found myself going on the internet and looking up some college courses with her voice in the back of my head. Maybe I could become a better man. The kind of man that Cindy could admire. I wasn't no Richard Gere, and this wasn't no pretty woman, but I would be lying if I said my feelings for her were strictly sexual. There was a reason that she was the one getting paid when I picked up that phone every month. She was the best. The next month rolled around and I called once more to set up a date, only this time Rocco, her driver, answered. She don't work here no more, he said bluntly. You want another one? Oh, I said, for lack of a better reply. Did she quit? Go somewhere else? Listen, he said sternly. She ain't here, get it? Now you want another or no? Uh, no. I'll call back. Click. He hung up on me. I spent the rest of the day wondering what might have happened to her. Maybe she took what I said about her being a hooker to heart and quit. If that was the case, I'm sure Rocco wouldn't have let her go without some sort of fight. She told me how violent he was. I had seen it firsthand the night me and Cindy fell asleep together in my room. She looked almost as scared as I was when she heard Rocco's screams from the hallway. I kept thinking about all the things he might have done to her. Did he smack her around and that was it? Maybe he took it further than that. I began to feel the rage build up inside of me. If he hurt her. If he killed her. I decided I wouldn't be able to rest until I had learned what happened to her. If she quit, great, fine. 
I'd wish her the best and thank her for being so awesome to me all the time. In fact, I hoped that was the case. She just up and left the greener pastures. But I needed to know for sure because something inside told me she wasn't okay. I was going to find her. If I had to kill every pimp in this fucking city, I was going to find her. Friday night I headed over to Panda's Billiards on Queen. I hadn't been there since I got off coke and I really didn't want to go back, but if I was going to find information on any of the underground filth in this city, Panda's was the spot. Walking in, I was immediately spotted by some familiar faces, ones that I would have rather not seen, but tonight I was glad they were there. The greasiest fuckers in the city, these guys. If anyone could tell me what I needed to know, it was them. Mikey was the first to come over, animated as always with his arms throwing finger guns in the air. Of all the people I missed in my departure from the scene, Mikey was it. He came in arms wide for a hug, knocked me back a few steps. Daddy! He roared. I could smell the gin off him. I'm sure he had a few bumps in him too. I laughed. What's good, Mikey? Been a while still. How's Proline? Yo, my ticket came through tonight. I'm up 800. No way. That's sick. But I lost bad a few weeks ago. I mean bad. That was Mikey though. He loved to gamble. Never really saw a problem with it. When he was up, he was buying everybody shots, and when he was down, he never got too emotional. I didn't know shit about gambling, but Mikey seemed to have it figured out okay. Listen, man, I said, I actually came to talk to Spins tonight, but I'll come check you before I go. I didn't want to cut our conversation short, but I noticed Spins coming out of the bathroom, and I wanted to get to him before one of the regular hungry custies took him off on business leave. I left Mikey there and headed for Spins, who quickly saw me coming. Oh shit, he said. Teddy fucking Grams. What's good, B? Long time no see. You been avoiding me or something? I dapped him up. Yo, I need to talk to you. Go for a smoke? He agreed, probably thinking I was looking for a score. But when we got outside and I told him the story, he barely could respond. And Spins was never short on something to say. Finally, he came out with it. You are fucked, huh? What the fuck is wrong with you? He started. I haven't seen you in months. Now you're coming here asking me to help you find some prostitute you're fucking? You're fucking prostitutes because it keeps you off coke? Are you fucked? Are you serious? This is why you brought me out here? Jesus, fuck. He started towards the door, but I grabbed him. Spins, hear me out. Don't fuck me on this. How many times did I have your back, huh? How many times? I saw him stop in guiltful reflection, but I thought I would remind him some more anyway. Remember when we got pulled over last spring? They took you away to the tank, but who held on to your shit? I did. They could have searched me too, but I did it anyway. He turned back to my attention and ceased for the door. I went on anyway. Remember in 8th grade, when Tommy DeLuca wanted to kick the living shit out of you for touching his girlfriend's tits at recess? Who jumped in and saved your skinny ass from getting knocked the fuck out? You did. You're fucking right I did, I screamed. So please, just help me out on this. She might be in trouble. Yeah, yeah, he said, conceding. But for one last shot, he added, She probably just told him to block your whack ass because she was tired of fucking you. Spins knew some people that could trace Cindy's number and find out the address of wherever they were working out of. From there, it was up to me. It only took a day until I got the text from Spins telling me where I could find the prostitute headquarters. The only other piece of information he could raggle was that it was tied to Colombian gangs and headed up by a guy named Rocco Saltino, who I had already come to know myself in the recent months. It's hard to forget a man who says he will kill you the next time you fuck around. To quote Spins' description, he was fucked in the head and would shoot my motherfucking ass without a second thought. It would be foolish to assume that in my search for Cindy, I would not have to cross paths with Rocco. I was going to have to face him, that was for sure. The question was, would I be prepared for it or not? With that in mind, my next request of Spins was to find me a gun. With some stroke of chance, he was at the moment looking to unload a heater he had used in a street mugging the night earlier, so we met back at Panda's. Of course, he was adamant that if I fired the gun, even once, it was my problem and I would owe him for the purchase of the weapon. After the lectures were over, he took me into the alley and showed me how to use it. He modeled the gun in his hands for me. This is the trigger safety, so you don't have to worry about leaving the safety on. But at the same time, there's a greater risk of shooting yourself in the dick. Keep it tucked in the back. The bullet you got is the bullet you got, so once you're out, you're out. Don't go getting in a dramatic shootout, alright? He handed it to me. I had not been a stranger to guns in the least, but this was the first time I held a loaded one in my hand. It made me wonder what the fuck I was getting myself into. What if Spins was right and Cindy just told Rocco to ignore my calls because of that little spat we got into? Imagine I went all the way there and that was the case. I'd feel like a fucking idiot. A creepy, gun in his waistband, stalking a hooker idiot. But even with that in mind, I had to do this. To tell you the truth, 
I was even feeling a little heroic about it. In the movies, the hero always defeats the bad guys and gets the girl. But in real life, from what I've seen, the hero always gets a bullet in the head. I thanked Spins and said goodbye. He headed back inside Pandas and I got in the car, resting the pistol on the passenger seat. I started the engine and gave myself a quick pep talk in the rearview mirror. God damn it, Cindy, I muttered. Hold on. I'm coming. I woke up at around 11 a.m., parked across the street from the address Spins gave me. I was surprised at the area. It was one of those office complexes on the edge of town, just by the car dealership on Dixie. I don't know. I always pictured a prostitution lair in some unknown alley near the lakeshore and not beside an H&R block in a passport photo joint. I was kind of disappointed a little. At around 2 p.m. was when I saw Rocco come out, followed by one of his escorts, a black woman. I never really got into the black girls. I'm sure they were great people. I just couldn't get past the contrast of the black skin to the pink pussy. Asians were always my go-to. I don't know why. A friend told me maybe it was because my small dick enjoys a tight pussy. Makes sense. I just thought that Asians had really nice skin is all. I watched them get into Rocco's car, which I had become familiar with from all the times he came to drop off Cindy. Once they took off, I got out of my car and headed around to the back to look for the yell pipe. If you weren't a shit-disturbing little kid when you were growing up, you probably won't know what a yell pipe is, so let me learn you. A yellow pipe is located in the back of many strip mall buildings, connected to the gas dial and stretched up to the roof where it connects to the receptor. This allowed us access to the roof entry into the building. It wouldn't mean shit if you didn't have the keys to each store, but if you wanted to smoke a joint in a warm place during the winter, this was your sanctuary. I headed up the yell pipe and dropped into the roof entrance, leaving me in the long hallway of the complex. I found the door and made my way in. How? Well, here's another lesson for you. If you kick a door directly below the knob, Usual locks can't hold up against the force. Four hard kicks and the door swung right open. Inside was like any other office. A desk with a computer and a file cabinet in the front, and then a long hallway with a few separate rooms, all closed off. I figured my best bet was to go room to room, thinking maybe he had her tied up somewhere. I realized how fucked that sounds, but obviously it wasn't thinking too straight for a guy who was breaking and entering with a gun tucked in the back of his waistband, looking for a missing hooker he was slowly falling in love with. Normal had kind of gone out the window. One by one, I kicked my way into the rooms. There was nothing. They were completely empty as if no one had been occupying the space at all. No sign of Cindy. I headed back into the main room, figuring maybe if I broke into the file cabinet I could find something. Don't ask me why. I started pulling at the cabinet box, trying to break the lock. I was making so much noise bouncing that thing back and forth I must have not heard the door open and him come in. But I definitely felt the blow across my head that sent me straight to the floor. What the fuck is this? I heard a familiar voice say. Rocco had returned. As I was on the floor, dazed from the hit in the head I had just received, I felt him take the gun from out my waistband. He grabbed me and threw me over so I was on the floor facing him. When he saw my face, I saw his reaction change from relief that he knew the culprit invading his business to anger that some bitch Custy had the balls to break into his place. He took Spins' gun and pressed it hard against my forehead. You! He screamed. What the fuck is wrong with you, kid? You want to die or something? Don't kill him, another voice said. A woman's voice. I looked behind him to see the black escort he had left with earlier. All I could think was, I'll never say a bad word about black pussy again. Where's Cindy? I said. What did you do to her? Before I could wait for a response, I felt the butt of the pistol hit me hard against the face under the eye. I fell right back on the floor. You got some balls, he screamed. Either that or you're fucking stupid. What the fuck are you doing chasing this girl, huh? Can't you get no pussy for free? It's never free, Rocco, I said. I mean, there's dates, gas money driving them around everywhere and listening. Shut the fuck up, he barked, throwing a hard pounding kick to my ribs. I felt like I was going to puke. He took the gun and forced it into my mouth. I felt the cold metal press against the roof of my gums. I had never been so scared in my entire life. I'd like to lie to you and tell you I would have taken death easily for the honor of a woman. But the truth is... When that gun entered my mouth, I forgot all about Cindy. All I could think of was how shitty I had been living my life. Why was I fucking with prostitutes when I could have been out looking for a real woman to wife? I didn't want to die all alone in a suburban pimp house. I was pissing myself. No, literally. I fucking pissed myself. Make fun all you want. See how you react when a gangster shoves a loaded pistol in your mouth. I'll see you in the diaper aisle. Over the accompanying escort's whimpers, I heard Rocco say crystal clear, 
I'd shoot you in the mouth right now, but knowing your type, you probably told some of your faggot friends where you are, and when you turn up dead, I'll catch a murder charge. So I'm gonna do things different and try the honest approach. She's gone, you understand? She took off. I haven't seen her, but trust me, kid, I've been looking. If I find her, she's gonna get her worse than you. Now get the fuck out of here. Don't ever let me see you and don't ever call that number again, you hear? What? He took the gun out of my mouth. Yes, sir, I repeated. I got to my feet and headed for the door. The escort witness took a few steps back, avoiding any possible confrontation. Once outside, afraid to get in my car for fear of Rocco spotting it, I hailed the nearest cab and headed to Pandas. I needed a drink. The usual, said Panda. I nodded as I slid my jacket off and rested it on the stool behind me. It wasn't a moment before Panda brought over my pint of bud when I felt a pair of hands around the back of my neck that made me jump out of my seat. I spun around to see Mikey there with his lovable, shit-eating smile. Jesus, Mikey, I said. You scared the fuck out of me. He gave me a good once-over, noticing the swelling below my eye. What the fuck happened to you, dude? Forgot to leave a tip, I joked. Nice. Well, you look fucked, just so you know. Thanks, Mikey, I said, taking a swig of my pint. Always nice to see you. Just then I heard a voice on the other side of me say, Ted? I turned my head to see, to my surprise, the black escort that I had seen with Rocco not hours ago. I say black escort because for some reason, black hooker just sounds racist. Either way, politically correct or not, she was sitting beside me. I thought she was there to kill me, to be honest. But then she spoke. Don't be worried, she said. I followed you here. Rocco doesn't know. I stared at her blankly. Anyway, listen, she said. She pulled out a small piece of paper from her purse. I know you're okay. Cindy talks about you all the time. She says you're good people. I trust her. Thanks, I said, for lack of a better response. She handed me the paper. Here's where she's staying. She's okay. Sort of. Rocco can't know about this, but I trust you. She trusts you. Go to her. I took the piece of paper and nonchalantly slipped it into my jean pocket, like the grams I used to grab off spins. And that was it. She got up from the stool and left. After she was gone, Mikey turned to me and said, What was that about? You got your car here? I asked. He gave me a funny look. Duh. Down for a ride? Fuck yeah, he said with a smile. Where to? To Cindy, I said. Who? I'll explain on the way. I dropped back the rest of my drink and handed Panda a ten. Then I turned to Mikey and said, Ride out? He threw his head back in laughter. Mikey loved a good adventure. (laughs) Fuck yeah, boy. Let's go fuck shit up. Gross, you pissed yourself, said Mikey, looking at the seat I was sitting in regrettably. I grinned. Not like fully, but there were some definite squirts. Fucking nasty, dude. He shoved the gun in my mouth. What was I supposed to do? I don't know. Not piss yourself, maybe? Yeah, yeah. Everyone's a critic. Mikey twisted his face and pinched the bridge of his nose. He rolled down his window promptly. You still have that gun Spins gave you? How do you know about that? I asked, lighting a cigarette. That night he gave it to you, he came back into Pandas and told me, if that guy doesn't get my piece back to me, he's going to owe me some fucking loot. Well, I guess I owe Spin some loot then. What happened? Rocco took it. Mikey laughed. Didn't it go down like you thought it would in your head, huh? Nope. You didn't even get to pull it out, huh? Nope. Lost it within the first minute. What an action hero you are, he teased. What a crazy story, though. You should write a book or something. Fuck. Who reads anymore? Hold up. Here it is. We parked the car in front of the townhouse complex and I got out. Mikey stayed in the car. I kept walking until I got to the unit number written down on the piece of paper. I knocked on the door and waited. It seemed like an eternity waiting for someone to answer, but when it finally opened I was face to face with Cindy. For a moment we stood there silent. For all the effort I put into finding her, and for all the things I thought I would say, I had nothing. Finally she broke the spell. Ted, what what are you doing here? Her eyes widened. And what happened to your face? Immediately, I started tripping over my words. I, uh, I I, I called Rocco, and he said you weren't around. Uh, I I thought maybe something uh, happened to you. Sorry, uh, I actually feel really stupid right now. She opened the door wider and motioned for me to come in. We walked into the sitting room by the kitchen, and I told her everything, from breaking into Rocco's to her friend letting me in on where to find her. She put her hands up against her mouth and, in almost a whisper, she said, Oh. My. God. You are so fucked. She only said what I had been thinking to myself through this whole ordeal. 
I pressed my hand against my forehead, as I usually did in times of high turmoil, but I watched her look of disbelief grow into an almost impressed smile. Huh? <laughs> she continued. Are you for real? You did that? For me? You are... Wow. They say chivalry is dead. She threw her arms around me and tackled me onto the couch. Then she kissed me. I have to admit, it felt good to know that she didn't think I was a crazy stalker. But I was starting to get the vibe that a kid in grade 6 gets after he conjures the balls to ask out the 8th grader. Like, that's sweet, but come on. I knew that all along, I guess. I admit that in my head I had hoped for a fairy tale movie ending. But my life had been far too real of a performance for me to truly believe it would turn out like that, holding her close in my arms as the screen went black over a final kiss. I didn't know why she was about to shut me down, but I knew she was going to shut me down. Even still, I had to know. Why'd you take off? I asked. She looked up at me. I'm pregnant. I responded with, holy fuck. Then I decided to try to redeem myself by saying, do, do you know whose it is? My boyfriend's. She had a boyfriend, of course. That would definitely be the why. You have a boyfriend? I must have looked like such a chump because her face just melted with flattery. Yeah. Oh, Ted. I mean, you're super cool and everything, but you're a client, you know? Right? I straightened up quick. I was good at that. No. Yeah. For sure. So, how, how can I help? I, I want to help. Rocco said he was looking for you. You must be looking to get out of town somehow. We have train tickets out of the city tomorrow. We were just staying at his mother's for now. So, you're totally okay? She laughed despite herself. Oh, Ted. We wished each other well and she decided to walk me back to the car where Mikey was waiting to say a final goodbye. As I got to the door, we stopped in an awkward silence, both of us unsure exactly how to part. I wish I could have stayed in that moment forever. But, of course, that moment was interrupted as the sound of tires squealed around the corner and Rockwell's car started darting quickly towards us. Without a thought, Cindy took off hard into the townhouse, slamming the door behind her. Before I knew it, the car was parked and Rocco had gotten out, gun in hand. I jumped behind Mikey's car for cover as two shots went off. I'm gonna kill you with your own fucking gun, motherfucker! I heard him scream. I couldn't see him. I didn't know where he was. Discouraged with my current hiding spot, I leapt out from behind safety of the car and sprinted across the street in hopes to find refuge behind a green electrical box. I heard two more shots fire. He missed and I was only a few yards away from safety. Then another two shots went off. I jumped behind the green box, unscathed, or so I thought. It wasn't until I was crouched on the grass behind it that my leg began to sear with pain. The only way I can describe it is like a really bad grease burn, if you've ever had one. The pain becomes so intense that your body tries to numb your senses and you become trapped in a state of shock. Your only hope is to try to control your heartbeat to slow the bleeding and put pressure on the wound. The only comfort I had was knowing that if Rocco was indeed using Spins' pistol against me, then he had fired off six bullets. And as Spins told me, once you're out, you're out. Rocco had done himself the disservice of finding himself in a dramatic shootout. But then, I heard another three shots, different from the noise of Rocco's shots. In stupid curiosity, I peeked my head up from where I hid. There, I saw Rocco, lifeless on the ground, and over him a young man dressed in blue. A cop. Jesus fucking Christ, I muttered to myself. They shot him. After they took the body away, they took me over to the hospital. Before I left, one of the officers took my information and told me he would have to meet with me when I got out of care to discuss the whole ordeal. I'm sure Mikey had a wonderful time in that station, creating up some bullshit reason why he was again in the wrong place at the wrong time. Mikey was always superb with cops. A clever kid, that guy. Maybe, I guess, since he was so into gambling. He just knew how to play the odds. As the paramedics pulled out of the street, I caught a glimpse of Cindy looking down on me from the top floor window. That was the last time I ever saw her. I don't remember much of the hospital. They had me fucked up on all sorts of painkillers. All I remember is walking outside where Spins was waiting for me. I got in, we lit a cigarette, and we drove. In the whole drive, he only said two things. I'm glad you're alright, and you fucking owe me for that gun.